Good evening and welcome to tonight's regular scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. You will see there are a number of chairs empty tonight. I just want to explain that um, when we changed our schedule to single month, some other people, some of these people had engagements already scheduled uh, for the school year, so our, some of our board members are missing. However, that said, they are going to dial in for a couple parts of the agenda in a few moments uh, to cast some votes. So I just want to let everyone know why they are gone and it uh, wasn't their fault as much as it was ours changing the schedule on them. That said, if you could turn off your cell phones like I just did and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under, under God, God, indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. With that, uh, Madam Secretary, would you call the roll? President Wasserman? Here. Vice President Branstead? Absent, but she'll be calling in. Secretary Gorton, I'm here. Treasurer Kaminsky? Here. Member Baker? Not here. Member McFarland? Here. Member Singer? Also not here this evening. But we do have a quorum. Right. Thank you. Um, there are no formal requests to address the board. Does anyone care to address the board this evening? Welcome to the microphone. We always like to hear from you. Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, presentations of the board. And the first item is uh, our final budget adjustments for 13-14 and our 14 approval, final approval, if it comes, of our 14-15 operating budget. budget. Uh, always one of the final things we do at the end of the fiscal year. We typically adopt the end of one June and amend at the end of the other one. And so in the final budget process, we have to estimate the amount that we need to complete the year and attempt to adjust all of our accounts to match. And in this case, uh, it's actually a little more complicated than you would think. You'd say, well, gee, we're seven days away from the end of the fiscal year. We should have a pretty good idea where we are. Uh, that would be true other than much of our teaching staff chooses to spread their pay over the course of the summer. So we have to go through the process of what's called the accrual. We know what they earned during their school year, but we actually end up paying about $5 million after the point at which this budget is adopted. So we have to anticipate all of the wages that go into there. That's the July and August payroll for the teachers, and it is also the final payroll for the salaried and the hourly employees. We've got one more payroll coming up on this Friday. Uh, because we are self-insured, we have our remaining medical and dental expenses, and this is always a very anxious time for me because we pay weekly and I have to attempt to estimate what the final two weeks of payments will be. And as you know from looking at the graphs over the years, the numbers could be anywhere from $50,000 a week to $600,000 a week, typically more likely 120, dollars which is what I kept in the budget for this period. But I will be watching. We typically find out Wednesday morning what the bills have been for the week. And if you hear a huge groan Wednesday morning, you'll know that I, I was pretty far off the mark. Uh, we also have our outstanding purchase card balances. We use purchase cards in lieu of formal purchase orders for many of our purchases. And we have to get a sense of what's out there. We have a cutoff date fairly early, but we do know that there are some expenses that have to take place during the month of June. And so we have those out there. What are called encumbrances. Those are purchase orders that someone opened early in the year anticipating that they were spending the money. Sometimes they put out a fairly liberal amount knowing that they're going to spend something under, but the encumbrance is still open and so until that purchase order is formally closed, we're not certain whether the money's going to be spent or not. And then we have our June utilities bills, which for a district our size can run into uh, many tens of thousands of dollars. So all of those are yet to be determined and are the biggest points of estimate as we go forward. That said, 
we have to do our best to make sure that we don't exceed the amount that's budgeted when we close the books next week. Uh, not only total in the bottom line, but by function. That means if we've said that elementary education is going to cost $12.1 million, it can't cost $12.2 million, even though the overall bottom line for the district might be okay. We have to adhere to that within the function. Uh, interestingly, I, I would describe <coughs> the budget process, the final budget process is probably more stressful than any of the other budgets during the course of the year because it's the one that requires the most estimating and degrees of precision, and there's no opportunity to go back and change it. Sue, if I may interrupt you. Mm -hmm. uh, did somebody join the conference call? Uh, yeah, you have Pam Singer and Lynn Baker here. Hi, thank you. Linda's going Hi, through Gary. an explanation of uh, the final budget for this year. Um, so I hope you can hear her. If you can't, bear with us till we get to the new, uh, till we get to the vote type of thing. Okay, thanks, Gary. Thank you. And the other thing that we have to wonder about will be, will there be changes on the July or August state school aid payments? State school aid is paid not matching our school year or not matching our fiscal year. It's paid from October through August. And so two out of the 11 payments are yet to come. Most should be pretty well established. We know at this point one enrollment will be, and that's the largest share of it. But there are some of the categoricals that change slightly from payment to payment. And we had heard earlier in the year that there could actually be an increase in the best practices money if fewer districts qualify this year that might leave more of the pot to distribute among those of us who did. So in all likelihood, if there, is if there are changes to state school aid, I would expect it to be positive changes. That said, the one area where it could go down would be if there were taxable value changes for either the current or the prior year. And those get reflected uh, on the state school aid payment as well. So in the past, up until the last couple of years, we used to comb through our federal spending and try to match the revenues to the expenses, knowing what we would carry over. And more recently, we've been asked, we collectively, the school community, to not do that and to put the full allocation in the budget and reflect that on the expense side, even though we know that we're not going to spend all of that money and that we intend to carry it over. So that means that the figures that you see in the budget revision are about $335,000 higher than they will be both revenue and expense when the audit is completed in July. Uh, net effect, because the two have to match, won't change the fund balance but it will make the revenue and the expense figure somewhat different from what you're looking at this evening. So snapshot, here's where we started, here's where we were in March, and here's where we are in June, and I've got some details on reasons behind the changes as we go on. Uh, revenues expect to come in at 78.8 million, expenditures 81.6 million, and at this point, time in the year we don't talk much about variance because I don't expect there to be too much variance from this point forward. Uh, we said at the beginning we thought after variance that the shortfall would be about 2.6 million needed out of fund balance. By March I was saying oh it's probably more likely 2.8 and in June it's looking like 2.79 rounded up to 2.8 pretty darn close to where I thought it was going to be in March. Uh, interestingly, in March, I didn't think there was going to be much more variance on the revenue side. I thought it would likely come on the expense side if it was there, and you can see that that's not the case, and I'll go into where that came from. Uh, so that's going to leave a spendable fund balance, and that's the fund balance that is not committed to gifts or tied up in inventory of 8.1 million or about 9.9 percent of the expenditure budget. And as we go through, the expected variance of the original budget was forecast at 3.5%. March, it was down to 2%. In June, it's down to 0%. So here's where the changes are. Uh, local sources of revenue between March and June, pretty close to each other. Uh, we had more of our changes take place between June to March, and we had some sizable gifts that are in there. 
And we also had a prior year settlement of Medicaid money that came from the ESA that was reflected as local revenue. Uh, state sources, again, somewhat down, and that's primarily the result of reduced enrollment. If you look at from June to June, uh, and then the other thing that happens is you have to look at state and local together because those two, one may go up and the other one goes down because of taxable value changes. And so more of the state aid comes locally or more of it comes from, from the state side. Uh, federal money did end up uh, larger than we originally forecast. We're always told to be conservative and not expect more than 85% of the current year. Uh, and then you'll see a large change down at the bottom, incoming transfers, that's money coming from other governments. In our case, that's primarily the ESA. So overall, the budget change from June to June, original to final, is 1.1% higher. Here's the major differences, and I gave the ESA a box all by itself because that's really the source of much of the change uh, on on the revenues. I, in addition to the prior year Medicaid reimbursement that we received earlier, we have another amount coming. We have yet another amount that will be coming next year. And I believe that that then completely settles the prior years of Medicaid reimbursement. So it, it's come out in pieces and we have one more piece coming. Prior year Act 18, Act 18 is the special education millage that gets distributed to the locals and then we pay a, a bill, a tuition bill on behalf of our students. And generally there is some adjustment, usually in favor of the local districts and in this case, uh, it's about $308,000, which is among one of the higher adjustments than, than we've seen. Uh, then the current Act 18 millage bumped up a little bit and that's just a function of the collection that the ESA did, uh, generated more than they originally forecast, as did the enhancement millage. And then in the last year of the ICT grant, there was a little bit more that was distributed out to the local districts as well. So those are the largest portions of the revenue adjustment. Uh, we did have a renaissance, more renaissance zone reimbursement that's likely to appear on our August state aid report. There was a property reclassification that will result in uh, more of a reimbursement there. And then we had some prior year state aid adjustments that didn't exactly match when we had to pay the uh, tax bills back. And so if they don't fall within the correct years, we have to report them as either revenue or expense. So about 75,000 of prior year revenues there. Uh, the expenditure side runs to a lot more pages and a lot more accounts. Yeah, Revenues cover just about a page. And expenditures, I think 17 or 18, and that's fairly small print and little tiny lines. But we adjusted 407 accounts, or about 80, ooh, probably 80% of the accounts as well. Uh, and the largest of them are the ones that are related to employee costs, salaries and wages, and benefits. And benefits are both health, medical, et cetera, and payroll taxes are classified by the state as a benefit. So the amounts that we pay to the retirement system, uh, FICA, Social Security, all of those are classified as benefits. So we have 45 different account types in that area, and that includes uh, contractual retirement stipends and wages for substitute teachers who are not contracted but work directly for the district. And always we get to the end of the year and there could be money left because there were unpaid snow days for hourly staff. Certainly that was a big consideration this year. There are positions that are left vacant or filled by long-term subs. We did some of that this year. Some of it we knew in advance and so we already had adjusted the March budget accordingly. There may be fewer retirements than anticipated. Actually in this year, I believe HR had to increase the retirement accounts, there were actually, I think, a few more retirements than anticipated. And then there could be mid-year vacancies, which caused the amount that was budgeted to, to be somewhat off. And there's all of our benefits. We self-fund medical, dental, and workers' comp. We do carry excess insurance for the medical and the workers' comp. Dental, it's a fixed amount, so there's no reason to do that. But those are all in the classification of benefits. 
So here's how it breaks down. Salaries actually ended up pretty being fairly close. 1% uh, drop March to June total. Salaries only 0.4%. Uh, benefits a slight increase. Purchase services looks like a pretty significant drop, but as you look at those categories, you'll note that they're fairly small, so it doesn't take a lot of dollars to make a large percentage account and or a large percentage change, where conversely in salaries you need a lot of money to, to move that dial on, on the percent. Uh, the supplies down somewhat, capital outlay looks like a big drop, but it's one of the smaller accounts to begin with. The other category, one of the biggest adjustments in the category that we call other is that's where we budget gifts at the beginning of the year. And so then when we get to the end of the year, we take whatever we have budgeted that we've not received and just take it out. So that not necessarily less spending overall, and it probably it is also reflected by a reduction in revenue on the other side. Uh, and the outgoing transfers, that's the other side of the money that comes in from the ESA, and the amount that we owe on tuition has gone up somewhat too. So that, that accounts for the increase there. So when you combine the expenditure variance with the revenue variance, it's about 2.1%, pretty close to the 2% that we were looking at back in March. And here's what it means for fund balance. I do not like the look of the last four bars in that graph. I guess I should be more specific. I do not like the slope that's represented by the last four bars there. You can see for a number of years it was somewhat spotty. Some years we were able to put money into fund balance. Some years we took money out of fund balance. For the last two years and this year, and expected for next year, we will be taking money out of fund balance and do not appear to be in a position to put any in. The money that we put in in 11 was a bit of an anomaly. We had a great medical year that year, and we should be pretty thankful for that because if you go back and look all the way back to 04, you can see that our pattern has not been to put much money into fund balance. And in 02 and 03, really what was happening is we were specifically setting aside money in anticipation of repayment of the tax appeals. And so that was a deliberate choice on, on the part of the board at that time. And that's the last time that we were able to put any significant amounts into fund balance. And we have been working our way down for the last few years. Uh, next year's estimate up there is using a conservative variance of 2%. So it could be somewhat better. Uh, or it could be somewhat worse. Without the variance, it would go down mm, past the bottom of that, that chart. And you will look at next year's budget in a minute. Um, so let me stop there and answer any questions. Thank you, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, for yeah. the diagnosis. Yeah, and just to interrupt the meeting a second, Angela, did you join? I did. You know, there's a lot of background noise. I'm having a really hard time hearing. Okay, interesting. It's pretty quiet here, so we'll, we'll continue to okay. try. Um, okay. We're just finishing up, I don't know if you caught that, we're just finishing up the reconciliation of this year's mm -hmm. budget. So. Yep, yep, I was listening. Okay. And I Linda, can hear you find it with Linda that I was having a hard time hearing. Okay. And she asked for questions on this year's budget at this point. Any questions or concerns? I don't. None here either. Okay. No. Seeing none. So you're asking us to approve this year's budget then, yes, right? Yes, please. I'll accept the motion for approval of this year's final budget. So moved. <coughs> moved by Mr. Kaminsky. Do I have a so second? Support. Support by Yvonne. Been moved and seconded. Um, since everybody, so many people on phone, I'll do the unusual measure of doing a, a roll call vote on these just so that officially votes can be recorded to show support or not support with so many people asking. So with that, we call the roll. President Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Branstad? Yes. Secretary Gorton? Yes. Treasurer Kaminsky? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Member McFarland? Yes. Member Singer? Yes. 
seven zero vote. Thank you. And now we'll move on to the next item, which is next year's yes operating budget. And this is absolutely unprecedented. We have never done this before, but we felt the need to bring a modification to the budget that we brought to you two weeks ago. Uh, but at the time, we started with the disclaimer saying that the state foundation allowance had not yet been established and that there were distinct differences across all of the proposals and that if it looked like there was a significant variance from what we went with and we used the governor's proposed budget uh, that we might need to amend in the fall. Well, I think it was that evening we received the email forwarded on from the superintendent indicating that the conference committee that was <laughs> attempting to reconcile all three of these had come to agreement and they did act on the budget that week. So I think that was unprecedented that we walked out of a meeting on Monday night and be probably before everyone was home, it was already out of date. And enough so that we really felt that we needed to more accurately reflect what was in it and not wait until the fall. So we bring to you some changes called the Omnibus Education Bill, and it was passed on June 12. At this point, the governor has still not signed it, but I believe that's expected later this week. So here are some of the highlights and the things that led to changes behind the, the scenes. Uh, the Per Pupil Foundation grant for districts such as Midland will increase by $50. We had used $83. That's a pretty sizable difference. Uh, in our case, it was about a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, and I use section numbers. They refer to the specific sections of the State School Aid Act. The Section 22F Best Practices Funding is going to be at $50, not $52. 52 is what we had budgeted. It was the current year amount, and it's what the governor had proposed. Uh, there was Section 147A, MIPSER's Cost Offset Funding. The governor had proposed repurposing that to actually lower our district retirement rate. Uh, in the final bill, that money has been maintained, so I put it back into revenues, but I also had to increase the retirement rate because it was not decreased the way that he had wanted to use the money. Uh, there's an additional money, and that's not all allocated to us. We don't get 262.9 million. That's allocated statewide in something called Section 147C to reflect the actuarially estimated cost of the required state share of the MIPSER's unfunded accrued liability. And currently there's a rate cap at 20.96%. That's not the full retirement rate that we pay, but that's the unfunded accrued liability. Uh, the estimate for the amount of money that Midland Public Schools will receive has gone from $292 this year to $502 next year. Now that's not extra money because that money comes immediately with a bill to repay it all in its entirety. Uh, and we had, because of the way the governor had proposed to use the money, we had budgeted the reduced UAL cap. And so for 14-15, for the revised proposed budget, we took it back up to 20.96%. Uh, since these were pretty substantial changes and we knew we were going to do modifications, we did decide we needed to do the budget. And rather than just absorb that loss <coughs> of per pupil revenue, uh, we looked at the various departments and the next day began talking with the technology department about cutting their spending. They're one of the larger departments and a, an area where it is sometimes possible to defer or to change the way that they spend their money. And we couldn't just absorb that and move on as if nothing had happened. So we built an immediate reduction in expenses as well. Uh, we also used the opportunity to make some revisions that occurred after we prepared the budget. Uh, we discovered just last week that there was uh, a bit of taxes that we had requested to be levied that weren't. In fact, that's behind the resolution that you'll be acting on later. That revenue on the advice of our auditor needs to now go into the 2014 budget. 
Uh, we also discovered that we had put the IBPYP diff entirely in 1314, and when we went back and double-checked all the dates of payment, realized that a portion of that should have been recorded in 1415. So that's there. And then I believe at the last meeting I had said that I had just received the quote on the dental expenses, and after carrying forward the increase from the previous year, discovered that the dental costs were anticipated to actually go down. So that's built in as well. Try to get as much cleaned up before Mr. Cooper has to try to step in and figure out what, where all these things are. So here's the difference. And it, it's going to seem very strange because I just said to you that we're losing $250,000 in per pupil revenue. But you will see that we're actually looking at over $2 million in additional revenue, but there are also additional costs. And there would be more additional costs if I hadn't reduced the dental and had not, if we had not reduced the technology spending. And most of the additional costs are Lansing based. Yes, they are. Uh, the <coughs> amount that is going into that unfunded <coughs> accrued liability uh, in gross dollar terms is jumping from 2.2 million this year to 3.8 million next year. And I have a per pupil breakdown for you a little bit later. That is huge. Uh, the other sizable increase there is that the 147A money, which is MIPSER's cost offset for us is over $600,000 per year. I had not included that in revenue. I had shown it as a reduced expense as well. So I've increased the expense and then also added that money back into revenue. There was an estimate from the state of $82 per pupil is what they expect us to receive, and that's equivalent to what we have in this current year. Uh, so all told, we have more revenue, more expenses, uh, the shortfall is somewhat better. Somehow that doesn't look right to me. Oh, I'm looking at the change column. I'm going to say that's not the 200. Yeah, the uh, shortfall dropped from 3.6 to 3.3, and we would expect the fund balance to be at 5 million at the end of the year. Just a, a little up uptick from where we are. Um, I think we, we benefited from being able to incorporate the, the additional gift money and the dental reduction. That was tens of thousands of dollars right there uh, in some of the other pieces that we built in. What you will see is that the salaries didn't change. Benefit costs went up significantly because we had to build that additional $1.6 million and some additional retirement costs in there. So it was just through um, combing through some of the accounts to scrape out whatever we could to, to try to find something there. On a per pupil basis, this is what it looks like on the state school aid side. And we actually will have less per pupil revenue next year than we do this year. I, if you net it out, I, I shouldn't say per less revenue. We will have less money to spend per pupil because we'll have $50 more in the foundation allowance We'll have $2 less in the best practice incentive. The MIPSERS rate cap is going up $210. So the total additional to this district is $258 per pupil. On the expense side, the figures that are being used statewide is that the Section 147 employer contribution, where what we pay will go from 24.79% will go to 25.78%. Statewide estimates are that figure should be $60. When I went through our very specific set of circumstances, which includes some wage reductions and reduced FTE, uh, it looks like it's somewhere between $52 and $55 per pupil for us. The 210 that's coming in Section 147C goes out again as an equivalent expense. So while we're going to receive revenues of $258, our expenses per pupil are going up $262. State mandated expenses. Yes. Yeah, the, what, what you tend to see 
is a focus on the revenue side and the additional revenues that are provided to districts. What's often lost in the details are the additional expenses that are also being mandated for districts that offset that additional revenue. So Linda, to be maybe a little flippant, the right hand claims it gave you $250, $258 more per student without talking about what the left hand did mm -hmm. about taking $262 mm -hmm. per student out. Do yes. I have that? Yes. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So when folks read the headlines about all the extra money that was legislated to schools, particularly minimum public schools, what's not talked about is the, the fee required to fund the retirement system, which is greater than the money that was brought in. So net, net, we're getting less money per student than we were last year. Yes. Yep. We have okay. less so <coughs> available resources. So be careful with the headlines. Roger's on it. <laughs> yeah. Le Linda? Yes. With ever since the spring, as the budgets have been developed, the Senate, the House, and the Governor, hasn't it been the theme all along that we would have more funding with there being a surplus, some of that split out for roads, some for education, and it's uh, any chances of a Hail Mary pass on this and maybe having some adjustment because it just seems like it's maybe it was overlooked, I don't know, intentional, well, but and our government's pretty big, but. When I said that the Section 20 Foundation Allowance is $50 for districts such as Midland, uh -huh. that applies to about 150 districts in the state. The remaining districts saw additional money and most of the districts in our vicinity received $175 per pupil. And because so there was additional money, it just wasn't distributed our direction. Do you know why? That, that's kind of my question because I know that with us being a 20J district, the way that it was set up with Proposal A and we have the privilege of spending more because our, doesn't our taxable, or taxpayers in this district pay more? Our, our taxpayers than we end up receiving? pay not only the standard rates that are paid elsewhere, but they also pay what's called a hold harmless millage. So yes, our taxpayers do pay more, which permits us to receive slightly more than the state mandated or, or state established maximum per pupil. But the net effect with this year's budget is we are, even though the taxpayers in this community are paying more, we're receiving less to fund our schools. And to answer Mr. McFarland's question, I think in much of the state there's a perception that the fact that we still have more is not looked on kindly and so this is adding 175 to some districts and 50 to others is an attempt to equalize that spending. And to, to lend historical context and Linda or, or Mike correct me if I'm wrong, the state long ago, I won't even say it was legislated, but agreed that funding would be whatever they would allocate to most districts, the quote unquote 20J districts would get 50%, half of that. It's called the 2X formula. Sure, which, which way, you, at least there's one half formula of the 2X formula, whichever you want to view it, uh, from which perspective. This year, for whatever reason, it came out of the conference committee much different than any of the bills from the House, the Senate, or what the governor wanted to be a three and a half X difference. So notice that difference, the 175 versus the 50. Historically, if they'd used the 175 with the 2X formula, we would have gotten, call it 80 some thousand, or 80 some dollars, like we planned. Uh, with the three and a half X to accelerate the equity differential, or accelerate the depletion of the equity di differential, <coughs> we only got 50. And the problem with only getting the 50 is not enough offset for the increase in the retirement fund, hence giving us a negative. So the real issue, as Mike would say eloquently, is around the three and a half X formula to us because that resulted in not enough revenue to offset what needs to happen to the retirement fund. You know, we pay what we're supposed to pay for retirement fund. It's a percentage of, of, our, of our income. So if, if we decide to pay our teachers a whole bunch more money, we have to pay a whole bunch more money to future support their retirement. Conversely, if we pay them a lot less, we have to pay a lot less. So we pay our fair share of 
retirement burden because it's percentage of pay based. What happens with the one third, well, one third and a half uh, formula? Um, there's just not enough money to cover that differential. And what I've heard over so many years is that um, when Proposal A first came out, that there was many weaknesses predicted in Proposal A, and this is probably we're experiencing some of that right now. Well, what was supposed to be, in the wasn't supposed to be Robin Hood, and right. and uh, it slowly <coughs> has evolved to that as resources got tight. It was who are you going to give it to? And the problem is our voters voted to pay for Midland, and now it's not coming back. The twenty J line item was line item vetoed by the yep. former governor and, and continued because it's politically almost impossible to get it resorted in because when you look at the number of districts Linda talked about it's a minority yeah they're a minority is that right Mike yes <laughs> sadly but yes <laughs> <laughs> so uh, again we're not in control of our revenues and sadly we're not in control of a big chunk of expense because the retirement fund state took that over 25 some 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and with exciting benefits and how they decide to pay for it, and we just go along for the ride and write our checks. So, that's it, eh? We have until July 1 to adopt the budget. <laughs> so the right hand gave us 258 a student, and the left hand <coughs> asked for 262. Hmm, tell the deal. We need to talk to that left hand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or to the right hand about su supporting and offsetting the left hand. Okay. Um, with that, any other discussion or comments for Linda? The only thing I keep thinking of is Proposal A was 20 years ago. And the problem is most people who have kids in school right now were barely around at Proposal A. We were, <laughs> you know, practically still children. And so we didn't understand. Now, looking back, you know, we don't understand the inequity. And so, you know, what caused Proposal A to pass and why we have more, people don't understand now because they weren't really paying attention 20 years ago to people who currently have kids in school. So I can see, you know, because I've had other people say, well, that's not fair that you guys get more. But they weren't back then also experiencing the same thing. So, well, it's also I, I mean, I can understand. I can understand why people, you know, are like, well, that doesn't sound fair, because 20 years ago was a long time ago when Proposal A passed. Well, the, the, the part I find unfair, Angela, to be blunt, isn't that, you know, the, the mantra is that every student should be considered equal, and why not? Right. I, I, I can't argue against that. My problem is Midland voters chose to spend more. Right. Okay. I agree. And it's been appropriated from us. Right. The other part of Proposal A was the 2X formula. That was decided back then that in order to adjust districts, bring the bottom up and bring the top, um, at a slower rate. hold the top yeah. harmless and bring it the bottom up to the top without causing yeah. issues in districts, you'd use a 2X formula. And um, during that 20 some years, probably 60% of the time they've used a 2X formula. There's times they did not. And so this year we have this unprecedented three and a half X formula um, that came out which none of the three proposal had until they went into committee and so no one saw this coming and so this has caused the, the pain because you really can't adjust your expenses right at, at a pace of three and a half is what we're being asked to do and I'll, I'll jump in here because technically what happened is everyone across the board received a $50 increase to the district and the specific language is that they didn't use the 2x formula at all and instead created for the districts that are getting more than $50 a separate equity payment of $125 which may or may not be ongoing but the practical effect for districts was three and a quarter x is there any talk with uh making the payment per pupil basis more equitable is there any way that we could be taxed equi equitably is there any way to get rid of that burden that the community has the taxpayers have a chance in that happening uh, if we chose not to levy that we would have fewer dollars available 
we get, we get the state's not going to make that the up same for as us. as other communities, then we get hit, and we'd we'll be taking more, more dollars. Whatever, whatever no, you put into the no system, if you take it out of the system, they take it all out of you. Nowhere to run. Nowhere to run. So now that that's we've all vented on, on our issue, and we everybody in this room is horribly depressed. Yeah. We, we yeah. will disappointed. Manage it. We will manage it going forward. Very disappointed. And we've mm -hmm. been managing it over the last decade. It just hit an accelerated <coughs> hit mm -hmm. this year that mm -hmm. we weren't expecting. You know, that came out of nowhere out of conference committee. It, it, the only time, you know, and I'm not a legislative expert, but it's the only time I've seen two bills go into conference <coughs> and not end up at one or the other or the middle, but to end out somewhere else <laughs> that was totally different than the bills that went into conference. That, that's what that's what caught us most by surprise so but we'll manage it and we manage it and we'll continue to be a good district it's just frustrating to constantly chase your tail when these things come up so, we'll so with that we'll move into a motion uh, would anybody care to make a motion to for acceptance of this year's budget as proposed so move on this one too move by mr kaminsky support not for me i'll support it. support support by yvonne <laughs> Uh, with that, we'll do the like we did last time with so many members on the phone. We will do a roll call vote. Okay, President Wasserman. Yes. Vice President Branstad. Yes. Secretary Gorton. Yes. Treasurer Kaminsky. Yes. Member Baker. Yes. Member McFarland. No. Member Singer. Yes. We have a six-one vote acceptance of the budget. I understand Scott's vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll leave it at that. So um, for those on the phone, if you want to continue to join us, you are more than welcome to. Um, that's the end of the votes concerning the budget. We have one on a slight adjustment to a summer tax rate. If you want to hang on for that, you can vote okay, on that. Okay, I, I, need, yeah, I need to go. Okay, so thank you all for right. joining in, just so people know. All right. Angela's all the way in Mexico, and the other <laughs> folks are in Kentucky on a, on a uh, uh, church mission trip. So. Uh, this is a valiant effort calling in. We appreciate it. All and right, Angela's there take for care. work, not vacation. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is not, it's, yeah, not a vacation in more, in more us. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good night. Good night. Appreciate it. Jerry, this is yeah. Pam. Yes. Hey, I just wanted to, uh, to thank Linda for all her work and how, how nice it is to know that her and Mr. Cheryl uh, have been working so diligently to make sure we had several renditions, several options out there. And when things like this happen, uh, we're able to respond very quickly and have a good plan to, to move forward. And I really appreciate all the information and time that has gone into uh, putting, putting this together. Thank you. Duly noted and thanked by Linda, if you didn't hear. And Jerry, I'd like to thank Linda and wish her well since this was her last uh, budget presentation. Mm -hmm. That's thank right. her for making it. Thank her for making it um, easier for us to understand and appreciate all her hard work and those that have helped her. And uh, I wish her well. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, we'll see you folks later. Thanks for joining. You're right, welcome. Good night. Good night. <laughs> we'll save the rest of those comments for Linda till later. And now we'll move on to 3.3. I believe comes back to me and is another unusual departure from past practice. On May 12, you approved the tax rates that we would levy on in the summer of 2014 on property within the city of Midland. Uh, we levy our city taxes in two portions, summer and winter. In the townships, we just levy it all in one share in the winter. and. Because of the disparity in the taxable values of the various entities, that allows us to get about 50% of our tax revenue here in summer and 50% in the winter, which is permitted by state law and is very helpful for us because, remember what I said about state aid payments, we go through the entire month of September without any state aid and we have all the startup costs for the start of school year. So the fact that we have some tax dollars coming in is, is pretty helpful. Uh, and we levy property, I'm, I'm sure you have the resolution memorized by heart. We levy individually on what's called principal resident exempt property, what we used to call homestead, commercial personal property, industrial personal property, and 
the non-PRE, which is mostly industrial commercial real property. And what we discovered in the preparation of the 1314 budget amendment was that we seem to have a disparity in the amounts that we expected based on the size of the taxable value and the size of the levies. And through a fairly complicated chain of events, discovered that one mill on commercial personal property had not been levied last July. Now, commercial personal property is a relatively small portion of the overall taxable value of the district, which runs to approximately $2.7 billion, and this represents taxable value of about $64,000. Uh, but we consulted with the auditor, we consulted with our attorney, consulted with the city, and on our attorney's advice, we need to amend our 2014 levy to allow us to go back add the levy from 2013 for just a single year on top of the other commercial personal. Commercial personal pays six mills, uh, which is divided three and three over the course of the summer, and they pay the hold harmless millage. And so this was a portion of last year's hold harmless. Uh, so that's why you have a revised resolution. We, the state or the city is already aware that we are doing this. They needed to get their tax bills to the printers last week. Uh, and the attorney said we probably could get away without a revised revision because the law is very clear allowing us to do this. But he said, why not take the safe route and not only follow the law, but also have a revised re uh, resolution. So that's why you have that. And the only change to it is the paragraph that indicates uh, that we are asking for 4.9 mils for commercial personal rather than 3.9. Uh, one mill of which corrects for the authorized amount that failed to be levied in July 2013 and is authorized by Section 1211 of the Revised State Highway Safety Code. With that, I'd ask our treasurer if he has a motion he'd like to make concerning that. Absolutely. I'd like to make a motion for item 3.3, uh, approval of the revised summer tax rate. Um, I'd like to move <coughs> to approve the resolution of the revised certification of summer taxes for 2014 as presented by Mrs. Klein. A complete copy of the resolution shall be attached to the original uh, of these minutes. Any second? Support. Support by Scott. Um, I guess we, we have to do a roll call vote since the tax resolution, so we'll do a roll call vote. Okay. President Wasserman? Yes. Vice President Branstad? No. Offline. Online. Secretary Gorton? Yes. Treasurer Kaminsky? Yes. Member Baker? Member McFarland? Yes. Okay. And we have a 4-0 vote. Thank you. Passes. Um, hand it over to you, Mike. As you know, we've been restructuring our curriculum division for quite some time, and the final piece was the agreed upon compensation for what we're calling Teacher Leader 1s and Teacher Leader 2s, and we have a letter of agreement with the MCA on that, so we're looking for approval. With that, I'll accept the motion of approval of the salary letter. I move we approve agenda item 3.4, Teacher Leader 1 and 2, letter of agreement approved 2014-15. Support. Move Ms. Gorton, support by Mr. Kaminsky. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? There I have it. We have um, from our athletic directors um, a change in the fees paid by POM and our athletic athletes. And what they're really looking for when you read through that is to allow those who are paying athletic fee to get uh, free entrance into our events. That there's a change as well as um, a change for middle schools that is still included in there, which um, was green and center month ago. So. Thanks, Mike. And as a point of clarification, just to say it again, loud and clear, what we're doing is trying to butcher some of the pain of the, the pay to play by saying if you pay to play, you've already paid to watch. Yeah, our ADs felt it was difficult to charge that fee and then continually charge them to come into other events throughout yep. the year. Yep, that's a great idea. I'll accept a motion on 3.5. I would move to accept item 3.5 as read. Any support? Support. Oh, I'm sorry. No. Nope. Support. Support. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, you're good. Um, any discussion or questions? Seeing none. Yeah, just, just real, uh, sorry, just real quick. Is a, just appreciate the thoughtfulness of trying to uh, you know, look at you know what families are, uh, uh, what burdens they have, and the students and everything else. Just appreciate the thoughtfulness with that. 
All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. One three six. Yes, so we're looking to uh, for a three-year lease agreement with AppLink in order to purchase iPad Airs um, for our licensed staff in the district. The annual lease would be seventy-seven thousand uh, sixty-nine dollars, and total is two hundred thirty-one thousand two hundred nine dollars. At the end of that three-year lease, we would have the option to purchase the iPads for one dollar. If you have more de want more detail, I do have Blake here tonight who can answer that for you on the iPad purchase. A dollar each or a dollar? A dollar each. Okay. Um, I'll set the motion and we'll go into questions. Uh, anybody care to move on, on 3 6? I'll move to adopt 3.6 as read. read. Written. Yeah, it's written. Moved by Member McFarland. I'll, I'll support, support that. Okay. okay support yes. by yeah. <laughs> Mr. Kaminsky. Um, just as a point of clarification, Mike, oftentimes people will question gee, well, if you're leasing, it's going to cost you more long term than if you'd bought them short term. Do you want to mm -hmm. care to comment? It was a very small dollar amount difference. Apple makes a, a really attractive lease, and um, I'm going to probably say this to figure wrong. Blake, do you have it at the top of your head? Was it 6000 the difference of between lease right. and bridging? About 6000 And um, this was part of our adjustment for the budget that we just adopted. The $250,000 that we reduced the budget to technology was, was allowed to move from a purchasing to a, to a leasing plan. We do believe that we will also get that fourth year of life, so we'll probably purchase for a dollar down the road. And uh, generally, they're still functioning fine at four years. They just may not run the newest and the best stuff. That's been my experience uh, commercially also on leases versus buying. Any other questions or concerns? Just, just a quick question on as far as the, uh, the impact on instruction. I think that we see the day coming where we're going to starting to have more of one one commuting um, arrangement and we'd want our staff and um, our, uh, our, uh, our team members that are trying to prepare kids for the future I think that we have to stage some of that we can't do it all at one once to yeah. be able to do it but it's uh, we've got to start somewhere we've got to have some sort of continuous investment in technology um, computers get old we have things to replace and this is step two or three of that staging. So if you recall, mm -hmm. you um, uh, in the past had tried the, you have put in one-to-one -one in some classroom levels. You put some uh, mm -hmm. uh, iPads on carts in some classrooms. You've tried both, so both of those issues. And the next step is to have all staff trained and running and moving on those and then uh, continue to move that phased in process as we go um, mm -hmm. without, we can do this through general funds if need be. There are some cost reductions in other areas where we don't need the PCs uh, and some mm -hmm. a as well. So we've been able to reduce those costs and move those monies to here. I, I just don't see technology and the needs of the students waiting for budget t to change. <coughs> so I think some of these things we just have to do. Blake, I know you've done a ton of work behind the scenes in this, so just to publicly acknowledge your, your great effort, uh, thank you for all the work you've done putting this together. Thank you. Ditto. Wish we could do it faster. Mm -hmm. Okay, any others? All in favor of approval of 3.6, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, 3.6 passes. 3.7 is the purchase of, uh, <laughs> of the covers, the protection devices for them as well. And so they've been bid out, and we're looking for um, the motion on that as well. Uh, for questions, I'll accept the motion. Move to approve 3.7 as written. Moved by Mr. McFarland, support, support. by mm -hmm. Mr. Kaminsky. Any questions or comment on that? Makes sense to protect our investment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cheap insurance. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, 3.7 passes. All right, we'll move on to 3.8. We're staying in technology, um, and we're looking at replacement of our oldest um, computers in the district, and they are on a five-year replacement cycle, and so we're looking for the motion to spend three hundred seventy-four thousand five hundred eighteen dollars in order to upgrade those to from with C High Computer out of Rochester. Uh, accept the motion first, and we go into questions. Move approval of uh, agenda item three point eight uh, for the purchase amount uh, to C I Computer Products. Moved by Mr. Kaminsky, supported by support. By Ms. Gordon. Any questions or concerns? I, I did leave out on that that this purchase is through 22i Technology Readiness Infrastructure Grant. So that's a grant that's coming to us 
um, it's not coming out of general funds. You just answered my question if that was in the budget. <laughs> so <I was> <laughs> but by grant, excellent. Just, just a, a comment is uh, with these computers, they're going to be in labs. Students will have access to those. Is that correct? Sure. Um, I'm just yeah. thinking of the state requirements coming up where we have to do testing. Sure. We have to have mm -hmm. working mm -hmm. computers. We have to test students. And mm -hmm. if we don't have that capacity for the, again, Lansing mandated uh, you know, testing that's coming up, I mean, but we have many, many other uses as well. But, you know, again, I know those workstations are getting old and in desperate need. That is what that 22i money is targeted for. Okay. So we do get some help with that one, okay? Correct. Okay. <coughs> Can I clarify something sure. on that? The spot com component of this is something. Yeah. Else. Thank you. Uh, the uh, the 22i component of this purchase actually it, it allows us to get money back on every one of the devices that were purchased with, with laptops and desktop computers. Hundred dollars per uh, per laptop and fifty dollars per desktop that we purchased, put into those labs and, and the staff. This is a budgeted item out of our general fund our technology budget, and I want to say there's I think we got about thirty-five thousand of spot incentive money we received from purchases last summer that are going to help support that. So the the bulk of that three hundred and seventy-four thousand dollars is coming out of our. 14, 15 general fund budget uh, with about 35,000 helping to make up the difference. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Yeah, thanks for like that. Any others? See none, uh, take a vote on 3.8. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None in opposition. 3.8 passes. Moving on to 3.9. Blake, why don't you stay right up there and make sure I explain that one right, too, because that's <laughs> the least one I know. We're in technology still. We're looking for a purchase order um, to replace our oldest workstation computers. Um, no, excuse me, the computers. The PC would go on the back of the monitor to uh, make the workstation more. Correct. It basically allows us to provide like a pseudo all-in-one solution where we attach a small form factor PC to the back of the monitor more desk space. Uh, those labs are pretty tight in there. But, and a lot of these machines are also being used uh, for administrative functions. So if we're able to get that up off the desk and provide more space, it'll help pick up. Okay. Uh, accept the motion and we can go to questions. Move approval of item uh, 3.9 for the purchase of upgrading the computers throughout the district. Any support? Support. Supported by Mr. McFarland. Any questions or comments? Just a question for the audience that's that's here. We don't normally go through this many computer items, but yes. <laughs> Mr. Sobel, you have a very busy summer ahead planned, mm -hmm. and we are we are really in a hurry to get upgrades and things done through the summer. So, like, hopefully the audience understands why we're doing this at this time. So, but, yeah. and we do tend to approve every little thing versus aggregate stuff. So, just from a public perception, we want people to understand where we're spending money. Okay, we have a motion and support, I believe. Um, all in favor of 3.9, say aye. 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 Opposed? None in opposition, 3.9 passes. And with that, we'll move, finally get to you folks here in a second. Um, move on to consent agenda. Consent agenda, you'll see, uh, has 4.1 through 4.8B. Um, just a quick rundown, approval minutes, uh, resignation approvals, a leave of absence approval, uh, several bids on some smaller items, um, our spending that we did in, in May, and listing the purchase orders uh, above $3,000. Uh, I'll accept the motion on the consent decree and then ask for questions or additions or deletions. Oh, any additions or deletions? I should ask that first. I'm sorry. See none, I'll move into a motion for approval of the consent uh, agenda. Move approval of consent agenda items 4.1 through 4.8B. Moved by Ms. Gordon. Any support? Support by Mr. Kaminsky. Any, um, I did, since we have no additions or deletions, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, moving to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? None in opposition. The consent agenda passes. I'll move it on to Mike. We have Bob Parrish with us this, this evening. He's working on a video project, um, and we're 
and I want to apologize for all of you sitting in the audience waiting for this part. We went out of order in our agenda, if you notice, and that's really because of the call-in part on the budget. So we kept you through all that budget part. Now you know about our budget. So <laughs> I'll turn it over to Bob. We get to keep well, our audience for the whole meeting. Know, but now you know. <laughs> I would say though, positive is we get to end on a good note. So yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we look forward to this part of the agenda. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> good evening. I'd like to thank the Middle uh, Public Schools Board of Education for uh, providing me the opportunity share the success of the collaborative, collaborative effort between Midland Public Schools, everyone in education, and students and families. Um, during the last board meeting, I was very fortunate to be part of the presentation with the Siebert co-teaching model. Uh, we talked about the co-teaching that's taking place in fourth and fifth grade. During that presentation, I discussed that um, the inclusionary model uh, for serving students with special needs wasn't a new model, and it could be seen throughout Midland Public Schools um, in the middle and high school level. Um, during that presentation, we discussed the positive aspects uh, of course students to be included with general education peers as much as possible. We talked about the positive social and academic role models they see during instruction time. And also the, the support they received from peers and the, the added benefits uh, from the social relationships with other students. Tonight I'd like to continue that theme and highlight some of the success stories we've had and we will continue to have serving students with developmental disabilities in the general education environment. Tonight you will hear such terms as intentional, collaborative, independence, and supports. Over the last several months, been working, uh, Midland Public School Special Services Department has been working with the local parent advocacy group, um, everyone in education, to develop an informational video highlighting the success uh, of students we've had in the, inclusional, um, in the inclusive educational environment, and also the opportunities they've had while attending Midland Public Schools. Tonight I'd like to share the results of that collaborative effort and show you a video presentation that highlights the success of the You know, when we started the, with the project, um, help me out, folks. I think we did it as an informational video on inclusion and, and the inclusive nature, and, what, and highlight some of the things that um, Middle Public Schools has done and also successes. And I can tell you, as, as we've gone along, and we've been at it since November, somewhere in that neighborhood, that uh, Susan Drunrive did a lot of the video. She, she put it together, and we've had you know send um, drafts and looked at it. But what it's allowed me to do is, is step back and reflect that the number of staff that we have in our district, the number of administrators, paraprofessionals, teachers that put in the extra efforts regardless of budget situations, and all those things that we have to deal with as administrators, they continually come to school each and every day and do great things for kids. And I hope you saw that in the video, that we've got a number of students, kindergarten through post-secondary experience that have tr gained tremendously uh, with Middle Public Schools and, and their experience. and. Um, just couldn't go without the, the staff and, and the family support and the collaboration between both sides. So um, that's, I'd like to thank some of the families that are here. If you guys want to stand up and kind of introduce yourself, and we've got a large number of uh, folks that are here. And um, go ahead. I'm Laura Casey, and my daughter Melina, um, we've been here since school, kindergarten, kind of all the way through, and got an additional benefit as well. We both have very short loans at Marshall for one year. And I am Kate Kelly, and I'm here to thank Middle Public Schools. I don't know, but she would have five jobs currently. <laughs> wow. 50% um, of her jobs are paid, and 50% of her jobs are volunteer, but she thoroughly enjoys every one of them. So thank you. Come on, don't be shy. <laughs>
have the uh, Mr. Mrs. Drum right. Yes, I'm Susan Drum right, and this is my husband Ray, and we have uh, three kids: Ben, Abby, and Luke. Um, ben has graduated and is in college, and Abby just graduated this year. And Luke is uh, going to be a junior next year at Dow High. Um, he has taken full advantage of the system, and, and we have enjoyed tremendous collaborative effort from all of the situations that we've been in, and, and especially with Dow High and Bob and Charlie Cook. Enjoy school more. He wakes up excited to go, and we just really wanted to say thank you to the individuals who have helped him, and, and for all of them working as a team because the IEP process really did work for us. So thank you. I second all that. <laughs> <laughs> Notice the voice there. Yeah. yeah. set of people that you see every day. So thank you. My name is Carol Brown, and our youngest, Alex Brown, has graduated this year. Um, we also have two others who <coughs> have graduated and even graduated from college. So, <laughs> um, And Alex thought that because graduation was June 6th, June 7th, he was going to be out the door starting college. Well, that hasn't quite happened according to his time plan, but we're, we're working on it. <laughs> um, but I do want to, again, thank, as everyone else has, Midland Public Schools for the opportunities he's had and um, the collabor collaboration. Um, one thing that's interesting in looking at the pictures in the video and uh, the other parents talk about a second grader being invited to birthday parties. Um, the graduation pictures that have just come back, the proofs, and there were some kind of candid shots that some of the <clears throat> same kiddos that were in the younger videos are in these graduation pictures. And he's been invited to their graduation parties also. So that's, uh, it just keeps on going. Hi, I'm uh, this is uh, Tom and Terry McNamara, and our daughter Sophia just finished kindergarten. Uh, she's the youngest of uh, seven children, and the wonderful thing about her ability is that she's uh, able to have an education process the same way as all of her other siblings. And uh, she had a wonderful experience this past year in kindergarten, and we're really looking forward to her uh, having the same experiences that her older brothers. Good evening. My name is Sean Wilson. This is my wife, Gina. Our daughter, Georgia, was in the video, and I'm sorry, I'm emotional. I don't talk about her too much, but, um, you know, I remember a time, she was a second grader at Adams, but I remember a time when she couldn't write, she couldn't read, she couldn't speak. And, and I'm telling you, without the services of Midland Public Schools, I know for a fact that she would not have progressed to the level that she has so far. You know, again, she, I can't believe that, that she's going to be a second grader. You know, and we, I like the budget stuff, by the way. No, <laughs> it, it, it wasn't what? bad, but, but that's, one of, yeah. but, but that, that's one of the reasons I think that, that we're rooted in this community without, without these services. It's, it's a reason I think we don't leave. I don't look outside the area. Um, and 
all these services, all these things, I think that 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 we, that we don't um, tend to see or pay attention to. There, there are people you, you can see that that take advantage of these services, and um, for us, for our daughter, um, they're they're paramount. And you know, we, we were talking about budget and taxes earlier. That, that's a reason I think my wife and I've never complained about the money that we pay to this community. It's not just about the public school system. This is honestly the you know the 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 I think one of the most wonderful places on earth and we came here before we had our daughter and and that's the reason now that we stay here so thank you that couldn't have been the big finish <laughs> you know as we put the video together and, and talked about we just thought this would be a great opportunity to share with the board it's going to end up going on the, the ARCS website. It's kind of an informational piece, but to come back and look at um, through all the, the things that schools have to go through with budgets and those kinds of things, the tremendous efforts and, and still uh, work that's being done by our staff, teachers and administrators in the buildings on, on behalf of all kids, um, just to bring you back to why we're doing what we're doing. So, any questions at all? And Usually, I let the other board members speak first out of protocol, <laughs> but I'm going to preempt tonight. Thank you. And my, my hat's off to you. Um, that's a lot of effort, I know. And I, I know I, I have a niece that is uh, specialized in the amount of time and effort the parents have to put in and balance and look at other kids. I, I just, I'm just totally impressed. And what I'm really impressed with is our staff and the parents working <coughs> together to find the right fit for your kids. And it feels so good when we sit here most meetings and someone's up blasting us for something we didn't do right <laughs> or, or something we're not providing or that we don't have enough money for or whatever. You really made my night. <laughs> so thanks. I would say too thank you to the parents for coming. It's so nice to hear from you. We, we see a lot of presentations and they're all great, but it's really nice to hear from you too, just to hear what your experiences are and to just to see really the people who really get the most benefit out of all the things that our staff and teachers do, all the amazing things they do. So thank you for coming and waiting so long to be able to <laughs> <laughs> say right. what you. I also like to forget about the budget for 20 minutes. That mm -hmm. was, that was, we can really end on a high note. Um, everybody said thank you to us, but really it's yourselves who should pat yourself on the back because you all have done an amazing job. And thank you for blessing this district with the ability to educate and work with your children. Um, don't overlook that. We, you know, we offer some services, but really it's, it's you guys at home that are, that are doing the heavy lifting. So thank you for doing a tremendous job. When we sit at our board meetings, we have in front of us our vision statement, what we guides us in our decisions as board members. And uh, this was developed um, by the community as, as far as the um, are kind of our guiding light for the district and uh, at the top it says MPS provides a dynamic world-class education that develops the unique talents of all students in a safe secure and healthy environment the very first item it says we commit ourselves to world-class standards for student performance I think that definitely this be able to have uh, to speak of our our special education programs and, and kids definitely illustrates that so it's just great to see that going in that direction so it's really great and I'm just interested in plans for the video. Um, sort of, the, you know, as they say, a necessity is the mother of all invention. So you, we have a way to showcase the school district. And we're going to have it there. It's going to be in the floor. Community presentations. And we do have a brochure or when your education brochure is there. Thank you. Thank you. That would be on YouTube and if anyone wanted to access that or just like the visit that again or send that forward to somebody else. Well, the link will also be on the ARC website and our Facebook page. So we're going to get it out. Um, it'll probably be scrolling. We're going to be doing some stuff this summer this year. It'll probably be scrolling on any of those screens that the community will see. So we're going to be blasting it. The other thing I'll say that uh, about the ARC and working with Laurel is, it, um, you know, her experience is just at Midland. You know, we've had folks from other districts, Traverse City and, and places like that come, so it's also a learning opportunity 
you know, as, as you know, sometimes we get unique learners in our classrooms, and say, and, and so it really takes a team to problem solve. How do we how do we work around and, and for that student? And so Laurel's usually out, uh, you know, cheering on middle public and saying, hey, you need to come look and see what we're doing and how we're creatively solving these problems or working with students. So that's another opportunity. Well, people from all over the state. Check our website out. Yeah. People from all over the state ask us questions, so you're going to be getting. It's going to get around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the video. <laughs> but I do want to say also, um, Jan Lampman is here, and she's the director of the Arts of Midland, and my boss. So I want to make sure I thank the Arts of Midland for providing us the opportunity because. If it weren't for us being a program with the ARC, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do every day. And really and truly, I can't say enough for the special services department. You know, Bob Harris, Jeff Hall, um, Dennis Shaw, Carla Cook, you know, people that have come and gone, but people that we're still in touch with today that have been exceptional administrators and people that we have a lot to thank for. So again, you know, makes Midland Public look great. But we really do look great in the 22 counties that I advocate for from Midland. Uh, I'm proud of our district. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Well, I'll wrap it up by saying thank you and, and thanks to our voters from the special ed village. We <laughs> can't forget who's paying for it. But it is, you know, we are partially paying for it, but everybody out there is paying for it. And um, uh, just, I know we're not perfect. I know we'll never be perfect, but I know we're always trying to get better. And uh, it's working together that makes it better. So thank you and uh, boosting our spirits as we go forward. Yes. Um, uh, and rededicate ourselves to improving everyone's education. So thank you. Uh, we have gifts from the two high school athletic booster clubs totaling $7,447, uh, benefiting a number of sports. And I'm going to use this as an opportunity to tell you about what I would call a gift in waiting. Last Friday, Mrs. Laux and I had a meeting over at the Midland Area Community Foundation with Bill Kennett and his son, Kevin. Now, Mrs. Chenoweth will remember Mr. Kennett. Yeah, he was on the school board I when I was Kennett. hired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in fact, he said he served on the school board during the 70s uh, all the way up through 1982, probably hired Mr. Cooper, too. Uh, anyway, the Kennett family, and as you can imagine, his adult children are now my age, um, felt like they benefited greatly from high school athletics, both the children and Mr. Kennett is still enjoying his athletic pass that he received when he <laughs> retired from the school board uh, that allows him to attend activities. And they as a family are working on setting up the Kennett Athletic Activities Fund which will provide support for those students who want to participate in athletics or prom uh, or cheerleading and perhaps don't quite make that cut for free and reduced lunch where we're able to provide a full waiver and so this will provide support for students to participate. Uh, they're working on the fund right now. It certainly doesn't require any board action but sometime probably next fall you'll be seeing a gift that comes from the community foundation from the Kennedy Athletic Family Fund that is supporting our, our students there. And it was just, it's a neat thing to see and I wanted you to be aware of it, although you don't have to take formal action. It's just another example of how great the Midland community is at supporting our students. And let me just say, I, I know Bill well. I know his son Kevin, and the other family was having a table there for Rogers <laughs> on occasion, at least once I remember. And uh, I know Kevin was the president of his class at Midland High also. And so it's great to have that family so highly involved in our system, and uh, I'll make sure I personally thank and them. The, the sister's going to be an active part in providing funds for the, the uh, endowment fund as well. So it's, it's a fi truly a family endeavor, and it was just a delight to work with people who understand it. I, I have to love the man when one of the questions he asked was, are we doing anything that's going to make this harder for the district? Oh. <laughs> Spoken like a true board member who <laughs> understands that <laughs> you want to do good, you don't want to make it harder. Well, thanks for all that additional good news on donations. Thanks to all the donors. Um, uh, the booster clubs work hard. The Kenneth's coming up, so thank you very much. I'll move on to HR, and I don't know who's handling HR tonight. Well, Bob doesn't have anything tonight, so I think it's Bob. 
Uh, we have just one uh, retirement. Uh, Joanne Eggner, I think it is, paraprofessional Siebert, effective on June 12, 2014. Thank you. And uh, correspondence to and from the board is listed there, and our scheduled meetings are also listed there. That's our new schedule. And as we uh, move into September, I expect that we won't have the conflict with some of the board members we had tonight when, when we all settle down. Um, at this point, we're here for comments or discussion from board members. I'll start to my right. Sure. Sure. Short and sweet. Um, you know, as we talk about the budget and uh, the challenges that are ahead, and I, I was, I mentioned this at a previous board meeting when we were handing out diplomas at graduation recently, is that a lot of the students who walked across the stage had a number of years of reduction in changes to um, Midland Public as they went through their education. And it's just remarkable that we continue to produce students that are high achievers, and I'm confident that uh, no matter what the challenges are thrown at us, we're going to continue to make those changes, and I think we're going to be very successful um, to continue to be a high achieving district. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm confident that we've seen more than half of the change that's come as far as budget and um, as our economy and as our uh, state budget adjusts, and I, I think that we're more than halfway, and um, I think we will get there, and I think we will be successful. Uh, so that's just my vote and remarks of confidence uh, as a treasurer for um, the board. Uh, and I'm also thinking in terms of how the challenges could be more difficult. Um, we have all of our stakeholders contributing in some way, all of our employee groups contributing. Um, you know, they're uh, having uh, pay reductions, contributing more to their benefits. And just want to thank those and our uh, working groups and MPS for contributing to that. Our challenges could be definitely um, uh, more than they are now. So. Uh, and I think the changes are, are underway. Um, just disappointed with, um, you know, with some of the, the challenges that we're getting um, with our surprise in Lansing and you know, some of the weaknesses of Proposal A. Um, I think Angela mentioned on the speakerphone that we didn't foresee the challenges that we see now from um, what the voters approved back in the 1990s. And I, I just think Lansing could do a little bit more to um, maybe bring that more up to date as far as how it impacts school district and education. Um, I think they have more work to do. Maybe there'll be a Hail Mary pass or something coming from um, our legislators or the governor um, to look at the, the left and right hand um, kind of disconnect. Um, hopefully s there's still something that can be done in this past week or so, or last week or so. Um, just it's sort of disappointing to see the taxpayers have them at paying more for the privilege of receiving less. and. And just so that public knows, we do advocate for the school district. We do contact, have regular contact with our legislators. Um, we do keep up that, that relationship. Um, we make sure they're informed, but this was a surprise, and um, we will continue to do our best. Okay. And I just really want to echo what John said. I, I just I admire your um, encouragement, John. I, and I, I feel the same way. I mean, it's been a sort of an evening of ups and downs downs first and of course it's very disappointing and in my mind just uh, very hard to understand because I don't think there's anything we do that's any more important than educating our children so I don't understand how that mm. all happens but anyway I just want to say too I we do always do such amazing things in the Midland Public Schools and I I feel optimistic I believe we'll continue to and I thank you again for coming tonight just being able to see all these things that you've experienced and um, just all the good things that happen in the Midland Public Schools and to hear your support for the Midland Public Schools and the benefits you've received that was really um, very moving for me so thank you again for coming. Um, the only thing I want to say is, is just we're going to pursue with vigor the surprising challenges we've been presented with by our legislators and uh, that's it. <laughs> we're, this isn't done. And uh, my comments tonight are thank you for coming out. Just thank you for bearing with us. Thank you for staying. I'm glad to see you're you interested. Um, mm -hmm. One thing that I've learned in 10 years of being on the board is that money is the grease of, on the skids, but the real energy that educates our kids are our parents and our teachers and the staff mm -hmm. that enables them. So when I get concerned about Midland and money, yes, I'm concerned. 
course, how do we treat our, how do we pay our people what we think they deserve for what they, what they render for our kids? But do I have concerns that we're not going to deliver what we've historically seen in this community? I'm not that concerned. Parents will rally, staff will rally, uh, people who care will always care, and dollars are just dollars. And uh, so I'm very confident going forward yet. Uh, we have not seen negative impacts to what we've done to date, and the people paying attention, Linda, in eight, seven, last seven years, we've turned, what, 10, 12 million dollars out of the budget, somewhere in that ballpark, on an 80 million-ish budget, so 12%, you know, and we're still delivering results, and kids are mm -hmm. still getting great experiences. It's, it's still a great place to work. Um, so I'm still feeling good that that will continue because with our flexibility and the adaptability of our talent staff and with our vitally involved parents, we'll get through this. Don't know how it is yet, but we will get through it. So, Mike. Well, on that note, I, I guess I'll mention that our new t TV screens that are put up there that everyone's noticed tonight, it didn't come out of the general fund, and it was, came from our great community that we have. It came from um, the, our partnership with the MCTV which is led by uh, Ron Beacom, uh, and they contributed the, the funds in order to upgrade the monitors as well as some of the other equipment in the TV studio as well. So I'm sure everyone knows that part today. Um, in, in closing, I want to also mention that we're still uh, progressing on our facility studies, and Bart Mallon French Associates will be in our elementary buildings on June 30, and our middle and high schools on Wednesday, July 2nd, to wrap up their end of the facility study and begin to actually do their analysis and then provide that back to you. That's all I have. Okay. Anything else for the order? Seeing none, we stand adjourned.